so glad to have you here. At least it's not raining really, really, really hard. It's kind of light drizzle earlier today. Um, so let's go ahead and stand. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then Lonnie's going to read some scripture for us, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, sing a couple songs. Let's go ahead and stand and bow our heads. Lord, thank you for bringing us here together, Lord, and I pray, Father, you would just continue to help us to come together as a church, Lord. Help us to see uh, your purpose and why you have us here, Lord. Uh, Lord, as we go through God's goodness, Lord, may we see the goodness of God in other peoples uh, as they experience Jesus Christ in their life, Lord. And uh, My prayer this morning is that this will be a reminder to us of how thankful we need to be for who Christ is and what he did on the cross for us. And so, Lord, uh, just continue to bless us, Lord, not uh, just our church, our community, Lord, and more importantly, our country, Lord. A country that just continues to struggle with one another, Lord, and and uh, we just know that however way the elections have come out, Lord, that you are still in charge, Lord. That position of being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has not changed. And so, Lord, just bless us, Lord, and just help us to come uh, to know you uh, even more intimately today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read from Isaiah 40. So bear with me, it is 21 verses, but I thought it was very fitting for just um, everything we're experiencing as Americans and, um, you know, whatever side that we fall on politically, um, God is still the one who is in control, is what Isaiah is talking about in chapter 40. Starting in verse 10, behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in the scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, and what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and whom did he make to understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are a, like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains, for its silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing, to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is a strong power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him that has no might increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's go ahead and sing. Play 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are seated. Thank you again for being with us here today. Uh, 
It's just been a great time of coming together and being united in the church and having that community of fellowship. Uh, what I want to do is just go over a few brief announcements if I could. Uh, hopefully everything is working online, praise the Lord. So if people are watching, uh, hopefully they see my face. Hello? They're not, they're not happy to see my face. Uh, just a few quick announcements. Uh, we are still doing church cleaning. We started yesterday, uh, but we won't clean the church until about uh, two weeks. So two weeks from yesterday, we'll come back and clean the church. It's not being used as frequently, and so we probably don't need to uh, come here every uh, Saturday uh, morning. Uh, also, if you're joining us online, you can give online. We we'll put the link online for you. If you're here in person, we I keep forgetting. We always have a little brown box up in the front. So you can put it in before you come into the church or after you come to the church. Just put it in the brown box, and then we'll go ahead and collect your tithes and offering. Also, uh, don't forget, Christmas is literally around the corner. Okay? Yeah, some of you are going, oh, no. Um, I mean, they already started Black Friday already. <laughs> like, wow. Um, so that'll be starting, which means we'll probably decorate the church. We're probably looking at maybe the first Saturday of December, maybe about 9 o'clock or so. We'll kind of gather, uh, decorate the church. And uh, give it kind of that festive look and anticipation of, of Christmas uh, coming soon. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and lead us in prayer, and then we'll have the Word of God spoken. Lord, bring us, bring us together, Father. Bring us together as your followers. Help us, Lord, to listen to your Word. To maybe, Father, we need to be still and quiet, Lord. And just absorb the reading of your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that uh, the word of God speaks to each and every one of us, no matter where we are in our walk with you. But Father, we pray that if there's anybody here this morning who needs to uh, fall in love with Jesus Christ, we pray that the spirit of God would just work in their life and tell them that they need to make a commitment to him. And Lord, we give this time to you. Help us to be free from any distractions that maybe we came in this morning. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to continue in our series talking about God's goodness. And uh, we're going to talk about seeing God's goodness in other people. And we're going to kind of see that from here. Uh, but some of you remember that in March of this year, in the middle of March, uh, the California governor uh, made an important announcement, right? He basically shut California down, right? He told everybody, uh, stay-at-home orders. Uh, businesses were immediately closed, except those that were deemed essential, uh, you know, gas stations, um, grocery stores, uh, those type of businesses that were deemed essential were allowed to open. Uh, we had to all of a sudden wear a mask, and we all had to kind of change our lifestyle. But I don't know about you, but those first two, three weeks, maybe a month for, for some of you, uh, I really miss the interaction with people. I mean, I'm not talking about like on the phone or through a video phone chat or anything like that, but I really miss the interaction with people. Uh, some of that happened that we couldn't interact at work, so we had to do everything uh, remotely. We had to figure out what this Zoom thing is and, and figure out how we can have Zoom meetings and, and be able to talk multiple people all at the same time. Uh, we were all familiar with kind of conference calls, but uh, Zoom meetings were a little bit different for some of us. But in addition to that, that kind of kept us very isolated from each other, even as a church, right? I mean, there was a long period of time where I didn't see some of you for, for months, right? And also, I, I couldn't go to my barber, which was horrible, you know? I, I don't like long hair, and it was hot. It's you know, starting to get into summer with spring, and, and some of those summer months, and my hair was going. And finally, you know, thank God for YouTube, you know? Uh, Marie looked on there, and she gave me a haircut, and it wasn't that bad, but, you know, I prefer my barber. So when they make that essential, I was like, yeah, good. But being in isolation can cause many problems. It can cause us to be uh, a little bit depressed, uh, a little bit kind of outside of the world. Uh, you know, we kind of really don't experience life together with other people. And isolation can cause even our school children. All of a sudden, they're not going to school and they're at home. And they're so used to going to school and having recess and playtime and being able to interact with their classmates. Uh, but also, like I said earlier, also work. You know, the workplace chatter no longer is there. But in life, we all need community. Did you know God wants a relationship with you? That God wants a personal relationship with you? 
And you can have that if you ask Christ in your life. Because God has never called us, even as Christians, He has never called us to be in isolation. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to go and make disciples, which means we need to be moving. We need to be going out into our communities. And how do we communicate God's word? Uh, how many of you remembered we had to figure out how do we do church? You know, because on Sunday, you know, at least for me, on Sunday, I'm kind of like programmed, like, okay, got time to go to church, get dressed, what I need to do. We had to figure all that stuff out. And luckily, we were able to kind of figure out how we can do that. And that provided some technological challenges, maybe for some of you. But being isolated kind of removes us from society. We are in the outside looking in to what are the next steps. I mean, remember also in March, what were we running out of? Toilet paper, right? Paper towels. And then we couldn't uh, do any type of cleaning supplies were gone. All the Lysol was gone. All the bleach was gone. I mean, it caused us different things. Even foods, right? I remember walking down the bakery aisle or down uh, where the pasta was and, you know, where all the carbs were. You know, there was hardly very limited but it's because we desire community and we desire because we're isolated to have some type of things together. But when we are isolated, sometimes we don't have any hope. And that's where we're going to find some people here today in our story in Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. We're going to find people who were isolated from society. Uh, people who had, were part of a community at one point in their life, but now something had happened to them something that was no fault of their own. And it caused them to be removed from society, from their family, from their friends, and maybe even their jobs. They were literally on the outside looking in. They couldn't go shopping. They couldn't have meaningful types of work. And they couldn't have interactions with everyday people. So Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. It says this, On the way to Jerusalem, he, being Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Luke kind of, uh, those of you who know Luke, he's a doctor and he's very detailed. And Luke provides us some geographical locations. Uh, one, he tells us about Jesus going to Jerusalem. And that helps us understand why was Jesus going to Jerusalem? This was going to be Jesus' last time going to Jerusalem. He was going there to die on the cross for you and me. But it also says that Jesus walked along the border of Samaria and Galilee. Now that's interesting because Jews don't get along with Samaritans. And so you don't want to even be close to them. You don't want to even have any dealings with them. You don't want to have any part of them dealing with your life. But yet Jesus finds himself going down this very important road to encounter people that weren't like him. Samaritans, as some of you know, were considered half-breed Jews. In other words, they were not full-breaded Jews, and that caused a problem for the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people always viewed themselves as we are God's chosen people. We know now that we have the entirety of Scripture that God's chosen people are those who believe in Jesus Christ. And that no matter what background you come from, you can have a relationship with Jesus. So Jesus is going down this road. It's intentional. He's going down between this border of Samaria and Galilee. And then it says in verse 12 and 13, it says, And as he entered a village, in other words, he was in the outside coming in, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance, and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So Jesus is on the outskirts of town, where you would find these lepers, because they could not associate themselves with the community. They were deemed unclean, which means they had to be removed from society. But not only that, these lepers plead, they shout to Jesus. Jesus is within shouting distance. And they plead with Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us. In other words, Jesus, have pity on us. Jesus, feel sorry for us. They want Jesus to be doing something in their life. 
But I also want us to get a picture as to what these lepers look like. I've never met anybody that has leprosy. And so I know it's part skin disease, so maybe they didn't look too well. But we can go in Leviticus chapter 13 really quick, verse 45 through 46. And it kind of gives us a picture as to what the leper might look like. It says this, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Isn't it interesting, as I read this, the leper has to cover his lip. Kind of like wearing the mask, huh? And it's interesting, if you want to dig a little further in the process of being deemed unclean required, you go to the priest, and if he sees you clean for seven days, he says, okay, you come back another seven days, and it's 14 days. And isn't it interesting that what they tell us with the COVID-19 is isolate yourself for 14 days. I'm just saying. But those of you who know people who have COVID-19 realize that they have to isolate themselves. They can't be near people because they don't want to infect people. And it's the same thing with the leper. They don't want to be near people, so they don't infect them. But they're isolated. They're alone. They're outside. They don't know what's happening in society because their lives are really, really changed. And one more thing here. The fact that Jesus is in close proximity to the lepers would deem Jesus himself unclean. The fact that Jesus was in close proximity to these ten lepers would deem Jesus unclean. So Jesus is double whammy here. <laughs> He's around people who are not like him. They're not Jewish. There's people that Jesus should not associate with. And number two, he would be deemed unclean. But yet Jesus doesn't run away. Jesus doesn't remove himself from the situation because he's put himself there for something great to happen. He puts himself for something great to happen. Look at verse uh, 14. When he saw them, Jesus, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus didn't lay hands on them. Jesus didn't say abracadabra or any magic words. He simply told them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible says, and as they went, they were cleansed. There's two things that are really important for us that are familiar with us who are believers in Jesus Christ. When Jesus tells you to do something, you do it. That's called obedience. The second thing is that you trust him. That's the part we usually have with. We might do some things that Jesus tells us to do, but sometimes we say, well, Jesus, are you sure? You know, we kind of question and we doubt. But we see that theme of trust and obedience. And these ten lepers, they listened. They didn't say they doubted. They pondered. They listened, and they went, and they trusted and obeyed. Right? And we have a hymn on that, right? Trust and obey. But how many of us have seen God do some miracles in lives of other people? And some of them are small, and some of them are big. Some of them may be answered prayer, and some things may be really great to have. But no matter how big or how small, living a life of G with Jesus requires us to experience a life change. We have to experience a life change. Their physical lives have been changed. They can now go back and have community. They can now go back. Isn't it great that we can gather in our churches, right? We gather because we want community. We always have a desire for community. These people can now go back to their family, their friends and maybe even attend church. Because now they would be declared clean once the priest saw them. But we must never forget what Jesus has done in our lives. Um, for many years now, and maybe my uncle is watching, I don't know, but I'm going to share it anyways. 
For many years, my family has been praying for my uncle. The majority of us on my dad's side are saved. We've come to Christ. We know him. Many of us are active in church or doing ministry in some other capacity. We're just very active people on my, on my dad's side of the family. But my uncle, who's been around Christianity all his life with my grandma, uh, going to church, and sometimes he would take my grandma, I remember, my grandma to church in his lowrider truck. You know, So it's not like he's unfamiliar with church, but he's never made that commitment. And a couple of years ago, I... Uh, started praying for my uncle specifically. I wrote him a letter about some of the things we used to do when we were young and kind of challenged him to experience Jesus Christ on his own and shared with him through a letter that I actually held back for a year. I wrote this letter and I held it back. I never sent it to him. And then finally I sent it to him. And it caused us to have a moment of time where we can have a conversation of Jesus because I had this uh, assignment that I had to do for school, so I asked him to do that. And so I shared with him from my personal story, from the scriptures, about why he should choose Jesus Christ. Why people in our family have chosen Jesus Christ. And he still didn't accept Jesus. Now my uncle had a lot of health problems recently. He has had kidney transplant and pancreas transplant, I think it is, or liver transplant. I can't remember which one it was. But he had two transplants. And luckily he's kind of, he got elevated on the transplant list and Finally, they found a person, and guess what? We were praying for him, and everything went fine. His physical life was changed, but his spiritual life was not. But many months had passed, and finally my uncle came to the realization that he needed Jesus Christ in his heart and asked for that. You see, sometimes people can be physically changed, but not spiritually changed. And I think with these lepers, we have the physical change of them, and it's a great thing that they don't have this disease anymore. It's a great thing that they can go back to their family and friends and experience community together. But something was missing in their life. Look at verse 15. It says, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his feet at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And then Luke points out, this is very important, now he was a Samaritan. Because the people who are reading this in New Testament times are Jewish people, and when they saw that, they would be like, oops. They would have a problem with that. And Luke wants to point that out. That look, this is someone who's not like you. This is someone who's not like you. He experienced the physical change, but something had caused him to go back to God. And the Bible says that he praised God with a loud voice. When is the last time you praised God with a loud voice? When is the last time you told God, thank you for who you are? Thank you for doing these things in my life. And he put himself in a position to worship Jesus and express his thanks. And so you have both Jewish, you know, Jesus being a Jew and a Samaritan together. Together, united. I was commenting earlier, I think, with Lonnie or somebody else about, you know, even though it looks like Biden has won, and no matter what side of the spectrum you're on, uh, if Biden has won, it still tells me that our country is so divided. Even when Trump won, we were still, it wasn't like unanimous. It wasn't like this. We're still divided as a country. And the only hope is Jesus. The only hope is Jesus. And so we got to continue to pray for our political leaders as well. But Jesus is now united with the Samaritan. Jesus, like I said, would have been deemed unclean for being in the presence of a leper, and he would have been ridiculed for being in the presence of of a Samaritan. And if you ever read the book of Luke, Luke uh, shows Jesus reaching out to the outcasts of society, to the people who are the lowest of the lows, to teach others what it's like to experience Christ. But this man came back, and he was thankful for what Jesus had done. He was thankful for what Jesus had done. 
there was a man, he was in the military and he was in the hospital. He had been injured. And his son, this little boy, was unable to visit with him in the hospital. And so what he did for his son was he made him a little wooden car. And he gave it to the orderly of the hospital and asked him, hey, could you take it down to my son? I can see him outside the window. So the orderly takes the, the little car, takes it down to the boy. The boy sees the car. The boy gets all excited. The boy's excited of the car that he's got this little wooden toy. He goes and he hugs the orderly. And the dad is watching and the dad is going, look, look, look. I did it, you know. I made this toy for you. I made this toy for you. He was disappointed a little bit. And the father was just a little bit taken off. And all the while, the father is shouting to his son, It's me, son. I made the truck for you. I gave it to you. Look up here. And finally, the mother was also there with the little boy and the orderly. And they pointed up to the top where the father was. Daddy made that for you. And when the little boy saw his dad, he said, Daddy, thank you. I miss you, Daddy. Come home, Daddy. Thank you for my truck. And the father stood in the window, tears rolling down his eyes. Sometimes we forget what it's like to have Jesus in our life. We forget to give thanks to God. Look at what Jesus says in the next verse. Then Jesus answered, We're not ten, cl ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? I tend to believe that these other nine were probably Jewish. Because Luke clearly points out this is a Samaritan. Where are the other nine? Where are the ones who should have known better, who had grown up in the church, who had grown up hearing about God and his miracles? Verse 18 says, Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Might I suggest to you that there are times in our life where we forget to say thank you to God. Or we forget to say thank you to God. We forget to look up to God and say, God, thank you for today. Thank you for everything you're doing in my life. And not only that, I think Jesus took what this man did a little bit further in verse 19. It says, and he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, I think he's saying something very important for us. He's saying your faith has made you well. Not just because you did, you trusted and obeyed, but you actually believed in Jesus and you actually turned back and come to give me thanks. We have a word in Christian terms called repentance. And it's this turning back and changing your mind from one way to another way. And I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ and I turned my way, I could give nothing but thanks to God to forgive me of all the sins I committed in my life. And I think that's what this man is. I think not only just was he physically healed, the Samaritan, I think he's spiritually healed. I think he understands who God is. He understands who God is. There was this lady, and she was on a little river boat, and her little girl fell overboard. And there was a man there with a Newfoundland dog. Have you seen a Newfoundland dog? They're really big dogs. They're about 150 pounds. And so the man told his dog to go get this little girl that had fell in the lake. Got the little girl, brought her back up on the lake, brought her close to the ship. They were able to uh, bring her. And the mother, of course, you know, wrapped her arms around the little girl, kept her warm, and wrapped her arms around the little girl and just so thankful for her. But she made sure to turn to the dog and hug and kiss that dog and being thankful for the gratitude of that dog. You know, that's more than some people have ever done for Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on the cross for us to save us from our sins. And we have to learn to live this attitude of gratitude. We have to learn to live this attitude of gratitude. 
And so what I want to challenge you today is to think about how you can live your life for Jesus. And if you don't have that relationship, let me tell you how. All you have to do is admit that you're a sinner. That you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. That he was raised again that third day. And that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that he rose on that day, on that third day, the Bible says that you will be saved. But you have to believe it from your heart. I can't make you believe it. You have to choose for yourself whom you will follow. You follow Christ or you don't follow him. You want to go to heaven? You have to invite Jesus into your heart. And maybe that's for some of you here today. Maybe that's for some of you online. So let's take a moment. Let's go ahead and stand and bow our heads and pray if there are anybody who needs to make that decision here this morning. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the wisdom that you provide us, Lord. Thank you for the story of Scripture, Lord, about how only one of them came back to you. And Lord, you declared that his faith had made him well. And Lord, maybe there are people who are here today and watching online that are struggling with their purpose and plan on earth, Lord. They're trying to figure out life their own way. They're making decisions on their own that they deem are necessary. And so, Lord, I pray right now, if there's anybody here this morning, if you need Jesus Christ in your heart, would you just raise your hand? If you're watching online, there's a button you can click on that you can tell us that you want to invite Jesus Christ in your life. If that's you, you just go ahead and click on that button as well. Anybody here this morning who wants to give their life to Jesus, just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Anybody here this morning? Anybody online, if you do that, uh, make that decision, just let us know. Lord, we give this time to you as a moment of reflection, Lord, of us to experience and embrace all that you have for us. So, Lord, we thank you. And we pray, Father, for anybody here or online that needs Christ, Lord. We pray they wouldn't wait, they wouldn't delay, that they would make that choice right now. And Lord, I pray that if the Spirit of God has been hugging, tugging on their heart this morning, Lord, that they would respond, Lord, that there would not be any hesitation. So Lord, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Out of my bondage, sorrow and I Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to thee. This is the different version, by the way. Out of my sickness and into thy health. Out of my wanting and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shameful failure and loss, Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come into the glorious gate of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of our sorrows and into thy bond. Out of life's storms and into thy calm. Out of distress into jubilant song, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of unrest 
and arrogant pride. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of myself to dwell in thy love. Out of despair into raptures above. Upward for I on wings like a dove. Jesus, I come to thee. Oh, Jesus, I come to thee. Out of the fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into the joy and light of thy home, Jesus, I come to thee out of the depths of ruin untold into the peace of thy sheltering fold ever thy glorious face to behold jesus i come to thee Ruin untold into the peace of thy sheltering fold. Ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee. Oh, Jesus, I come to thee. Amen. Thank you again for joining us here this morning. Just so glad to have you, whether you joined us here or online. We're just so glad you came and uh, been a part of our service here this morning. Let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads in, in prayer, and then we'll go ahead and be dismissed. Lord, uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing us here again uh, together, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would just continue to unite us, Lord, as a church, Lord, and continue to move in the direction you're showing us, Lord. Not only in our lives, Lord, but in the lives of this church. Uh, we want to have an impact on this community that we want to see so many people come to know you in a personal way. So, Lord, thank you, and uh, we thank you for the blessing and opportunity to just gather together and worship you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you for joining us here.